looks at you, he sees you through a kingdom lens of love. And you can go from just being loved to being love to other people. So far, it's been awesome. It's been really hot, but I am really happy to be here and really happy to be serving God. I'm hoping that I take away just more servant leadership and just no matter like the circumstance, just go with it with all I have. On the water bottles, there's labels with like a church address and it has a Bible verse. So people that are very thirsty and want hydration, we can hydrate them and also spread the word about God. There is always a place to minister to people. Whether it's big or small things, people can always be affected by anything that you do. Good morning. Aloha kakahiaka, everybody. Welcome to another morning here at NYC. Wasn't last night amazing? So good. In so many ways. Justin and Patrick's message, their stories last night about the church just captured my heart. I was just so moved about their story of how the church was a community of people that they kept meeting along the way and helping one another and through that they overcame adversity and struggles and the phrase that really stuck with me last night was with love and through the church the impossible is possible wow say that with me the impossible is possible that's great <laughs> The impossible is, is possible. And you are the church. And through you, with Christ as the head and we as the body, the church, we can accomplish the impossible together. Because when we do things together, we can do so much more. But I am reminded about something about the church as the body. I woke up this morning and a part of my body was really, really hurting my heels. I have uh, tendonitis in my Achilles and I, I had to limp from the hotel all the way here and it was so painful. And I, remember, I just realized something that the body, our bodies are imperfect and, and sometimes they have pain within it. And, and when we look at the body of Christ, that is sometimes a reality. And if you've been in the church long enough, you might have experienced some pain in the church, maybe directed at you or somebody that you love. And if that happens, I want you to know that pain is personified because we don't expect to have pain in the body of Christ. But it happens. And today we have an activity that we want to just flesh that out and help you with that. Some of you may not have experienced that. 
Some of you are experiencing the greatest time of your life in the church, but you have a hope for the church and you want to see something happen in your church that's even more exciting than it is, and we want to capture that as well too. Did everybody walk in with paper and a pencil? Good, hold that up. Let me see that. Everybody got that out? Good. Well, we want, to, we want you to bring that out, and we're going to go through an exercise that I pray sticks with you, not just for today, but for a long time to come. We're going to ask you a question, and this question is important. Here's the question. What is it about the church that you would like to change? Now, it could be your own local church, or it could be the general church with the capital C. And if it's something that has hurt you, we want you to write it down. If it's something that you just want to change, you have a hope for the church, we want you to write it down. And we want you to know something today. You can be totally on, uh, honest because you have complete anonymity. What you write down, no one will know it's you except if you write your name. So don't write your name on the paper. So go ahead and take a moment to answer this question. What would you change about your church or the church in general? Take a moment to, to answer that question. Okay, so take just another couple seconds to complete your thought. And we really hope everyone completes this. All right, if you're still writing, I'm gonna give a few instructions so you can wrap up. So something that's important as we think about our wishes, our prayers for the church, is that we know we don't bear those alone because that's the whole point of being the church is we do this thing together. And so we're gonna very literally share our, our thoughts, our prayers that are on our card with each other. And we're gonna sort of do it hot potato style. Royal Company is gonna help us out. And as the music plays, we're gonna move these around and we will, we will direct that, okay? So when the music stops, the card you have is the card you're gonna work with. If you're at the very, 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 very end, you're gonna pass up and down. If you're anywhere in the middle, you're gonna pass left to right. When we start, the ends are gonna go down with the passing, and all of you all in the middle are gonna pass left to start, okay? I think that would be, yeah, that way, okay? So, you'll go that direction until we yell, switch! switch. When we yell switch, send it the other direction, right or up, and then we'll say switch, and you'll send it the other way, okay? And Royal Company, when they stop, you're gonna hold the card you have. Everybody got that? Okay, ready, set, set. Go! go! Down or left? Left, everybody pass it to the left. Go right and go up. Let's do a quick switch. Ready? One, two, three. Switch! Go back the other way. We'll do one more switch to the side. You got off. Switch! All right, one, two, three, stop. Okay. One, one, two, two, two three. three, stop! Hold a card. Okay. That's okay, we know that some of you have a couple cards, some of you have none. So if you have no card, raise your hand and help distribute everyone. Send the cards around, make sure people have a card. If you don't get a card, don't worry. Don't worry. Okay? Okay. Here's what's going to happen. 
Most of you have a card. And that's a pretty sacred thing to hold the prayer or the hope of somebody else. If you don't have a card, don't worry, because you get to share in my or Gordon's request, okay? So we'll put up here mine. This is my wish for the church. I see in my work often that people are so afraid and that the church gets afraid. So my hope for the church, what I would change is that the church would not be motivated by fear, but live in confidence that Jesus Christ is the head of the church, amen? Yes, that is my thing I would change. So you can have mine. If you have no card, that's your metaphorical e-card from Melissa, okay? Or you can have Gordon's. And my prayer is for the specific church in Hawaii that I was a part of. It's called the Bridge Church. And my prayer is <laughs> that the Bridge Church in Hawaii would find a building of their own so that they could worship in. And that the new pastor there would lead the church into the greatest days it's ever known. I spent 20 years as the pastor of the Bridge Church. And for 20 years, we have met in a school we don't have a place of our own. Every Sunday morning, it's set up and tear down for 20 years. And my prayer is for this beautiful church that one day you'll find a place of your own. So we're going to offer a prayer over all of these cards. So you can hold the card or hold our requests or maybe one that you were not ready yet to write down that you're holding inside of you. Gordon, you want to pray over these? Take a moment and we'll give you a moment just to be quiet. Read your card. Lift it up to God. This is the prayers of your closest friends today. And let's go to God in prayer. I'll give you a moment to pray quietly. Father in heaven, you are hearing the prayers of your people for the church, your body. Father, Father in heaven, we ask, Lord God, that as these prayers raise, rise up to heaven, that you would gather these prayers, these prayers for the church that you have given your son his life for. We pray, Father in heaven, that you would inhabit these prayers and you would answer these prayers for the glory of the kingdom of God. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hold on to the cards that you have. Use them as a bookmark. Use it for, for whatever it is. Keep it because one day when you come across this card again, breathe the same prayer that you pray today and remind yourself that the church, when it is filled with love, can do the impossible. Amen.
Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you're our Father, that you didn't leave us where we were at in our sin and shame, but you sent your son Jesus to make a way. And so we praise you, we sing to you, and 
God, let us not get distracted by things in our lives and even the, the, the fun of this event, God. This right here, this moment, you are here in this place, and we don't want to miss you. We want you to know that it's for you and it's all about you. We love you and we praise you. Amen. And amen. Come on. Yeah. That's good stuff. Hey, thanks for singing with us. Go ahead and take your seat. I think I used to think that holiness was uh, an arrival point. I think I just, I just thought that I was supposed to, at some point in my life, get to this point of being holy. And so I, I, I think probably from an early age, I just put that away, um, thinking I would never get to that place, thinking that that holiness was unattainable, that holiness was a thing that I just wouldn't ever be. I think for a long time I thought I was supposed to act a certain way and be a certain way and I had to look a certain way and the truth of the matter is that was the thing that was killing me that I was pretending. I was pretending that I was okay. I was pretending that life was great and on the inside I was dying. Only until I found a group of people, a community of faith where I realized, oh, I'm not alone. I'm, I'm not alone in this this journey. I, I'm not doing this by myself. I, I think it's probably everybody's natural inclination to resist uh, groups of people or anyone getting to know us. I mean, really getting to know us. Only until I let people in my life and, and let them help me, let them love me, let them nurture me, that I realized that's really what a holy life is, a communal life, a life lived out in community, that I can actually live it out with people. Because I think that's God's intention, that we live a holy life in community, on this journey together. God wants to make me holy, and that He desires for me to be holy, but, but it's never going to be a place where I just go, okay, I've checked the box, or I've, I've landed, or I've arrived, and this is it. It's, it's a moving through, and that pursuit is the actual thing that, that creates the holy life. I think that the journey of, of holiness, the journey to be holy, being done in community, having people around you that help you, enables you to turn your face toward God, to turn your life toward God so that God can do the work. God can create in you a heart that is holy, a, a life that exudes holiness, a life that, that shows what it means to be holy. Rather than trying to pretend like you're holy, God is actually making you holy and, and having people in your life to help point you in that direction, that has made all the difference in the world to me. I'm reading from Psalms 51. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from your sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet, you desired faithfulness, even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Man, hello. Hey, NYC. 
NYC. Hey, NYC, listen up. God says, be holy as I am holy. God says, be holy as I am holy. And that's a big part of the reason that the Church of the Nazarene believes that holiness is kind of a big deal to the Christian life. And today we've been asked to talk about holiness, so no pressure. If you don't know me, um, I'm Shauna Songer Gaines. And, and uh, Tim Gaines calls me love. Callan and Evelyn call me mommy. And Trevecca Community Church calls me pastor. Where are you at? Yeah. And by the way, somebody better call me the next time that Chester is rapping with Michael Tate and I'm asleep in the hotel room. Call me. Will you call me next time? Thank you. So we're talking about holiness today. <laughs> I don't think you got my number. We're talking about holiness today. And I wonder, what are the images that come to mind for you when you think of holiness? What are the images that come into your mind? For a long time, when I think about images of holiness, I couldn't help but think about pictures of smiling people that seem to have it all together. You know, like the kind of picture that your family only takes on Easter Sunday morning because nobody looks like that the rest of the year. Church people know what I'm talking about. Like you have to look a certain way on Easter Sunday morning because Jesus is risen and Coles is selling $10 dresses. So get it together and get out the door, right? There are these pictures that everybody posts, like the Instagrammable moments of Easter Sunday morning of people that have it all together. And for a long time, it was easy to think that that's what holiness looks like. My family, we try that. This is the picture of my kids that we put on Facebook on, e I know, they're the best. That's a picture that we posted for everybody to see of Easter Sunday morning. That's the moment that everyone wants to believe that like a holy family looks like, right? Uh, uh, kids that just love each other all the time, that never fight. This is what Easter mo morning really looked like for us. <laughs> yeah, that's the real life, right? So why do we think that holiness is looking like we have it all together? Looking like we have it all together, especially the more that I read scripture and encounter the word of God, I encounter these very real people living in the real world with real messy lives who standing in the presence of a holy God come undone. King David is the one who wrote the psalm that Mike read for us. King David writes this psalm in Psalm 51. And in many ways, King David is the kind of guy we look to to say, man, he's got it all together. Sure, he was the youngest and the smallest of all of his brothers, but apparently he was handsome and deeply emotional and a musician. And who doesn't love a moody musician? And, and he was a man after God's own heart, right? What a description. He's anointed as king over Israel after he defeats the giant Goliath. He's anointed as king over Israel and then he reigns over the people of God during a period that's considered the golden years of Israel. I mean, this guy's got it all together if anybody does. Good King David's got it all together. And then one day he sees a woman named Bathsheba bathing on the roof. And we find out that the golden boy isn't as pure as we thought he was. 
He sees Bathsheba and he calls for her to be brought to him. We're given the impression that she's never given an opportunity to consent or decline this arrangement. She's brought to his room and when she becomes pregnant, although she is married to a man named Uriah, suddenly things don't look so good for good King David. And he's got to keep it all together. He's got to keep looking good, got to keep up appearances. And so he asks for Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, who's been away fighting in David's war. He asks Uriah to come home from war, spend a night with his wife. But Uriah is such a good and a faithful man that he will not go home and have sex with his wife while his men are fighting in the battle. And so then David's running out of options and he's got to keep it all together. He's got to keep up appearances. He's got to look good. And so he has Uriah sent to the front lines where he's killed. And I mean, David's not the one who killed him. It wasn't David's sword. In many ways, from all outward appearances, David still looks like he's got it all together. I mean, think about it. Then he even takes Bathsheba to be his wife. He looks downright benevolent, taking in the pregnant, widowed wife of a war hero, right? Wow, what a saint, good King David. He's really got it all together. One way that I talk about sin, sin is the unraveling of God's good creation. I want you to imagine with me a beautiful tapestry of so many different colors that is woven intricately and perfectly where every thread and color has its place to create a breathtaking scene. This is the the tapestry of creation that God has woven out of love with intricacy and care. Sin is the force that is like pulling a thread on the tapestry. Just pulling that one thread until it all unravels. And what used to be a beautiful creation now is just a, a pile of trash on the ground. That's what the force of sin in this world looks like. But the problem is, is that to you and I, it just looks so normal, like the way that things are supposed to be. Like this is just the way the world is. It's just this unraveled mess. So David might look like he's got it all together but he's actually tied up in knots and choking on his sin. And it just looks normal. Like this is somehow the way that it's supposed to be. But then the prophet Nathan shows up on his doorstep and says, hey, David, I want to tell you a little story. And Nathan tells David this story, a story of a man who had one sheep. This one lamb that he loved so much, this one like precious lamb. And and this is like his best friend who he takes care of and, and even snuggles with at night. I know it's a little bit weird. But he loves this one little sheep and And then there's a rich man who's got it all, who's got everything he could ever want. And he's got like hundreds of sheep. And the rich man sees the lamb that the poor man has and takes it from him. And David is listening to this story and he is enraged. He's absolutely enraged. And he says, who is this man? How could anybody be such a monster to do such a thing? Until Nathan reveals that this story is really about him and what he's done to Bathsheba and Uriah. And now David is just 
bewildered, like his world is turned upside down. He doesn't know up from down and right and left because now all of this righteous anger that he had about the man and the story, he has to turn back on himself and standing in the presence of the confrontation of his own sin, David is undone. Psalm 51 is the song of David's undoing. It's the song of David's undoing sung by a man who has finally realized that what he thought was just normal, that what he thought was the way the world is just supposed to be is actually living in the unraveled mess. And he is so tangled up and caught in it that he can barely even see it. But he finally realizes that he is entangled in sin and he is undone. This last year, I had the opportunity to to visit the lynching memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. It was a part of a week-long experience where we were looking at different civil rights sites all over the South. And we went to this lynching memorial. I don't know about you, I learned about lynchings in my American history class. To me, it seemed like this ugly part of our past that I'd rather not talk about because it makes me real uncomfortable. Maybe it does for you too, and you're thinking, man, I hope this is a short story. I mean, going into this, this trip and particularly going to the lynching memorial, I was really uncomfortable, pretty nervous, because as a white girl, I felt this sense that like, anything that I did or said just might make people think that I'm a racist. And so my whole like goal and objective for the day was just to make sure that nobody thought that I was a racist. Because I mean, I'm not a racist, I'm a pastor. I've got it all together. Before we went to the lynching memorial, however, we went into a museum where I read about a woman named Elizabeth Lawrence. Elizabeth Lawrence was a school teacher in the segregated South. She was a school teacher at an all African American school. Schools were segregated, white kids, black kids. And one day she's walking home from school after I'm sure teaching all day. And this group of white children start teasing her and then they start throwing things at her and calling her names. And Elizabeth Lawrence does what any school teacher would do. She scolded them, right? Well, those kids, they went home and they told their parents that this black teacher had scolded them. And her parents formed an angry mob. And Elizabeth Lawrence did not survive the day. And I mean, no one person killed her. And nobody was ever convicted for her murder, by the way. But somewhere in this mob, in this tangled up mess of hate and fists and spit and words and feet, it was all tangled up together in this gnarled mess that choked out the life of Elizabeth Lawrence. Standing there that day, I was looking for her name engraved on one of these iron blocks that are just hanging from the ceiling. I was looking for her name on one of these blocks and then finally somebody pointed it out to me and I came and stood and, and I just looked at her name hanging above my head like the onlookers might have gazed at the bodies hanging from trees. And I can't tell you exactly what happened that day, 
In fact, the only word I have to describe it is simply that I came undone. I was confronted by the fact in this moment that I am tangled up and choking in the same mess of sin that killed Elizabeth Lawrence. And here I am standing in this lynching memorial, and I'm more concerned about whether or not people think that I'm a racist than I am about actually confronting the reality of racism that is still choking out the lives of the sons and daughters of Elizabeth Lawrence. But I was so concerned and looking like I had it all together. I live in this unraveled world where it's easy for people to look at me and say, there goes good Pastor Shauna, she's really got it all together. When looking like we have it together in a world where sin is the norm is not helping. Like it's not helping to just try to pretend like we look all right and we have it all together. And the more that we try to look like we have it together, the less willing we are to confront the power of sin and the forces of the evil one that are unraveling God's good creation. That day I had to confess that I was a part of the problem, tangled up in the mess, and I came undone. Confession is the beginning of our undoing. David is confronted by Nathan standing in his lovely palace next to his beautiful pregnant new wife, and he is confronted with the sin that he is tangled up in and he is undone. He realizes that this fairy tale that he's living in is actually soaked in the blood of a man named Uriah, and he is undone. This prayer that he prays in Psalm 51, it begins with confession. Confession is the beginning of our undoing. Confession is when we finally realize that the world that we are tangled up in is choking out the life in us. And that I am a part of the problem here. You know, it's really easy to believe that the world is messed up and to be convinced that it is not my fault. Did you hear that? Just in case you missed it over here, it's really easy to believe the world is messed up and be convinced that it is not my fault. But there is this sin that has entangled us, and David recognized it. In fact, he confesses that he was sinful before he was born, that he was born a sinner. In fact, there's a word we use to talk about this. There's a fancy term. It's called the doctrine of original sin. And it's the idea that we're born in sin. We are born into this sin disease but sometimes I've heard people use this as a way to almost let us off the hook. Have you heard people talk like this? Maybe you've talked like this. Talk about what it means to be human. Things like, oh, you know, I'm only human, right? Like, what am I going to do about it? I mean, I'm only human, so of course I'm a little bit selfish. I'm only human. I mean, sure, that was kind of deceitful what I said, but I'm only human. I mean, yeah, we're all a little bit racist. We're only human. I mean, yeah, everybody's kind of judgmental. We're only human. I mean, we're all a little bit sinful. We're only human after all. It's like we're saying that just because everybody else is tangled up and choking in their sin, it must be okay if I am too, because it's just normal. It's the way it's supposed to be. But friends, that is crazy. That's not the way it's supposed to be, and it's not okay. And you know what? It's not the way that you have to live either. Because 
listen to this. My, my husband, he teaches about the Christian tradition and he likes to say that sin isn't what makes you human. Sin is what makes you less than human. And here's what makes you human. What makes you human is that you are made in the image of God. Amen. That is what it is to be human, is to be a person who is loved by God and made in God's image, intricately and lovingly woven into the fabric of this beautiful creation that God is crazy about. That's what it means to be human. That's who you are. You were created in God's image because God loves you so much. God wants you to be freed from the knots of sin that are strangling out the life that God breathed into you in the Holy Spirit. In Psalm 51, this prayer of confession is inviting you to come undone to the power of sin that is tying you up in knots and strangling the life out of you. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you, you are already reconciled to God in Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean that we can't still stand back and take a look at the world around us and recognize that we are caught up, tangled up, ensnared in some cultures and systems, patterns and behaviors that are using, abusing, killing, strangling the life out of ourselves and the people that God loves and the world around us to take a step back and to confess this world that we are living in because God's love for you, God's love for you is also for him and for her and for Bathsheba and Uriah and Elizabeth Lawrence. The love of God for all of creation. After David has come undone, he asks God to create in him a clean heart, to give him a brand new spirit, to put new breath in him, to bring him back to life. In fact, the Hebrew word that he uses there in Psalm 51 it's a verb that is only ever used in all of the Old Testament to describe the action of God. This isn't just create like you create a macaroni necklace for your mom on Mother's Day. This is creation like in the beginning God created kind of stuff. He is asking God to do what only God can do, to make him a brand new creation to bring him to new life. And you know what? Our undoing ought to lead to new creation. That's, what's da that's what David is asking for. He has been undone and now he needs God to make him new. But so often we dig our heels in we dig our heels in and we will not let ourselves come undone. We're too afraid of anybody thinking that we don't have it all together. But if we don't come undone, we can't let God make us new. The more we're trying to hold on to the impression that we have it all together, we can't receive the full measure of God's transformative love. And holiness is being made new in God's love, being made new in the image of Jesus Christ. New life, new creation, what only God can do. When I was 17, I had just gotten my driver's license because I failed the test a few times. Thank you, I'm not the only one. Uh, and I grew up in a family, I'm the youngest of three girls, so I never imagined that I would have a car of my own. 
You know, it just seemed like something that, that like the rich kids had. I was never gonna have a car of my own and that was fine. I'd borrow the family car, but now I'm 17 and I've got a job as a hostess at a restaurant on Truxton Avenue on the mean streets of Bakersfield, California. And, and I need to get to work and I need to get to school and I need to get to all the church activities and it, and it was becoming kind of tough to get to everything. My grandpa Joe had just restored a 1988 red Azuzu Trooper. It was an image of the new creation. He had just restored this Isuzu Trooper, and my grandpa obviously loved this car. He loves cars in general, but he loved this car. And I loved this car, and so he'd start saying, hey, Shauna, why don't you go ahead and, we, we called it Big Red, obviously, as you should. And he'd say, hey, Shauna, how about you take Big Red to work today? Hey, Shauna, how about you take Big Red to school this morning? Shauna, why don't you go ahead and take Big Red to that church event tonight until finally one day he handed me the keys and he said, Hey, Shauna, why don't you hold on to Big Red for me? And I loved that car. Big Red became my car, and it was a sign not just of, of that car or independence, it was a sign of my Grandpa Joe's love for me. And you could see it in every detail of that car that he had lovingly restored. I mean, every single detail from the color that he had picked out to the leather steering wheel to the sheepskin seats, because nothing says classy like sheepskin. It was pretty great. Every time it rained, the inside of the car smelled like a wet dog, and I loved it. I mean, every detail. He'd even taken out uh, the, the like radio tape deck in 1988, uh, the, the radio tape deck, because he didn't want me to get distracted while I was driving. If Grandpa Joe could see all of you looking up cat videos on YouTube when you're at a red light. I mean, every detail of that car, I could see his love for me. And I loved that car. I, I loved my Grandpa Joe, and my Grandpa Joe loved me. One night, I was driving home late through downtown Bakersfield, a part of the city where the lights are very close together, and I was tired. And I was looking at the light that was 200 yards away instead of the light that was right in front of me. That light was green, but the one right in front of me was red. And I cruised through that intersection at about 40 miles an hour, and I T-boned a Suburban. I blacked out and I came to and the officers pried the door off of Big Red and help me to the sidewalk. Incredibly, nobody was seriously injured. And I sat there on the sidewalk that night. My only thought is, how am I gonna tell Grandpa Joe? This isn't just a car, this is like a sign of his love for me. How am I gonna tell Grandpa Joe that I have wrecked Big Red, not just a fender bender, not just let's iron it out in the shop, like it is destroyed, it is totaled. How am I gonna tell Grandpa Joe? And certainly, like there was no way in a million years that I could ask my Grandpa Joe to build it for me again. I mean, that would have been crazy. That that would have been insane to ask him to do something like that after all the care and love and attention that he put into that car, to have the audacity to ask him to make me a new one. But do you know what my Grandpa Joe did? He rebuilt that car from the inside out. New body work, new steering wheel, new engine. It was like a brand new car. He rebuilt that car in love. It was his gift of love for me. Holiness is God's gift of love for you. 
And today I want to invite you that if you are tangled up in some of those knots that are choking the life out of you, keeping you from catching deeply a breath of the Holy Spirit, that it's okay to let go. To let go of the things that are entangling you to the knots that are tying you up and holding you back to confess and to come undone. You don't have to be afraid to come undone in the presence of a holy God because God longs to fill you up with the Holy Spirit and to bring you to new life, to make you a new creation so that you can be fully human like Jesus. You know what I think? I think maybe, maybe the picture of holiness really does look sort of like an Easter picture after all. Not the Easter picture of the happy, smiley family standing in front of the flower pots at church. Not that picture. But maybe it really does look like the Easter picture of Jesus out of the resurrection when he comes out of the tomb, still bearing the scars in his hands and in his side. The scars that remind us that God came undone for us. And if God came undone for us, why are we still trying to pretend like we've got it all together? We don't have to pretend anymore. Being a holiness people is not about having the the stock photo picture of a perfect life. That's just not what it is. Holiness is being made new in the image of God. And it might just look a little bit crazy. It might not look normal. In fact, it might seem like your life has come undone in the best possible way. My 15-year-old self 20 years ago in a stadium in Toronto, Canada in 1999 could not have imagined. At that NYC when I was 15 years old, I could not have imagined the wild journey that I would be on as God filled me with the wild wind of the Holy Spirit. I could not have imagined what my life would look like once I'd come undone. What might your life look like when you come undone? Stop trying to pretend like you have it all together and all figured out. I know it might sound scary to let go, to let go of those knots that you've been holding on to for so very long. But you don't have to worry about letting go because you are held in the fabric of God's holy love. Would you stand? Here's what I'd like to invite you to do. Go ahead and put out your hands palm side up so that you can see that these hands of yours, they are empty. They are holding nothing. I want you to go ahead and close your eyes. And now with these empty hands of yours, what is it that you are holding on to? What has got you tangled up? Are there relationships, maybe systems, behaviors, cultures, things that just seem normal that on any other day you wouldn't even recognize? It's just the wallpaper around you. It's in the air that you breathe and the water that you drink. You wouldn't even think it's a problem, but maybe, just maybe today, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and telling you that you are tangled up. What are the things that you need to let go of? Do you have that picture? And now what would it look like for God to make you a new creation? For your life to come undone? 
to let go of the things that are holding you back and to be filled with the wild wind of the Holy Spirit, to receive the gift of God's love that is for you called holiness, to be made to look like Jesus Christ. What would that look like? What are the images? What are the pictures? The gift that God would place in your hands today to take with you wherever God might send you. Because friends, God will send you into this world in holy love. And so now God, creator, redeemer, life giver, Lord, we ask today that your Holy Spirit would fall upon sons and daughters like you promised, like you showed us in the day of Pentecost, that you would fall upon your sons and daughters. Lord, would you bring forth from their life the fruit of holiness? Would you bring forth from their life the prophecies of love? Would you bring forth from their life the gift of service? Would you bring forth from their life the images of the kingdom of God as heaven comes to earth? Do you make them a new creation in your new creation, O oh God? God who has come undone for, for us. Lord, would you empower this congregation today to come undone for you? We pray it all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Creation still obeys you so. 
What a beautiful thing to have just witnessed and participated in. Stay standing. We're going to do some guided prayer. And we're going to move through three different sections of praying together. And what we're going to be praying are three different sections of scripture, something that has been so life-giving to me throughout my lifetime of conversations with God and listening to God is actually praying words of scripture borrowing these really incredible prayers from the Old Testament and the New Testament to help me fill in the gaps when I don't know what to pray, when I'm struggling to find actual words, or to have companionship, friendship with the people who author the Bible. And so we're going to pray through three different sections of Scripture. And 
We've just experienced in this last song here the wonder of the human body. And we've been saying to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength is actually talking about this thing, your physical body. It's such an important way to praise God through our body. So each of these movements of prayer, we're gonna ask you, suggest a different movement of your posture, literally what you're doing with your body to kind of pull some awareness into your body as we worship and pray to God. And so we're gonna begin with reading a section of scripture as a prayer and Gordon's gonna guide us through that. If it is possible for you, where you're at, on the floor, you may want to flip up the seat that you're in and take a posture of kneeling. And you might just come down on one knee if that's all you have room for. If you're unable to do this, then find a posture that works for you. And I'd like to lead you through a responsive prayer through Ephesians. It's going to come up on the screen. And there's your part, and there will be my part, and there's a part that we all pray together. And so students and sponsors, please join me in prayer. For this reason, kneel before the Father from whom all And I pray that out of the glorious riches, he may strengthen us with power through his spirit and our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. Let's pray. And we pray. surpasses knowledge that we may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God and let's pray together all of us now now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now we're going to ask you to change posture. If you want to stand, if you want to sit, if you want to raise your hands, we're going to offer a prayer for the world. And when we say pray for the world, that can feel like a really big, generic, kind of vague thing. And we believe it's really important to think about specific things when we pray. So we're going to call you to focus on something that, that is happening in the world that is not right. Something that's become unraveled that needs God to help it become new again. Maybe there's a burden on your heart for human trafficking and those caught in the trap of slavery. Maybe something that pulls at you and need for the world is those that live in unsafe situations in their own homes. Maybe you are so concerned about those who are in detention centers right now and are separated from their families, or your heart is for those on the move. Whatever it is, we ask you to focus on that as we pray through the Beatitudes together. Okay, so on the screen will be your part and my part as I lead us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. 
Amen. At this time, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. And this posture we'd like for you to take is to be unified because this is a prayer that Jesus gave for the church, that the kingdom of God would be unified in us. And so you may want to take a hand or touch a shoulder, reach forward to the person in front of you. And let's all pray this prayer together in unison. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us today our daily bread. And forgive us of our sins as we also have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the, and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. And as our final prayer together, we're going to pray the words of Deuteronomy. Yeah, we can clap now. <laughs> Let's do one more prayer together. It's our Shema benediction, the words straight from Deuteronomy that Jesus quotes again in the New Testament. Let's open our hands as we receive this and pray the Shema prayer together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And as for us, we will love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our soul and with all our strength, amen. Come on, let's sing this together. From the darkness I call your name into darkness Call me out, lifted me up. How great is your love! You bore my weakness and took my shame, buried the in fields of grain. You call me out. of heaven, you stepped out, yes, we stand in all, for we have been changed by the power of the cross, how great, how great, how great.
never been and there will never be. Come on, sing it. Huh? beginning can't control what tomorrow will bring but I know here in the middle is a place where you promise to be I'm 
Shauna, something you said has convicted me. Shauna said that holiness is not about appearances. And at times in my life, that's what I've made it. And behind this appearance was an unraveled life. But I also remember the story of David and the unraveled life that he lived and the invitation that was given to David to remain and still be holy. And so I'm reminded that wherever you're at and where I was, that God accepts us just as we are. Amen, he does. But he loves us too much to leave us that way. And the Apostle Paul tells us that if 
anyone is in Christ. They are a new creation. My prayer is that you receive that invitation to be a new creation, to enter into a life of holiness for the glory of God. That's so good, Gordon. And as Shauna is brought to us today from the Word of God, we are being made new creation. And because we're made in the image of God and God is in the business of restoring creation, then if we're made in the image of God, we get to be a part of restoring creation too, which is so cool. And that is a huge part of what our MWO work is about. It is about helping to restore all of creation. And so if you're going to an MWO today, stand up, because we want to pray for you. So stand up. Also, these districts are going to the experience, Kansas City, Alabama South, and Oregon Pacific. So Kansas City. Alabama South, Oregon Pacific, go ahead and stand up as well, because we're going to send you in just a moment when we send the MWO people. But let's pray over those who are going to be serving in the community and experiencing the experience today. Let's pray. God, we have been having such an incredible morning, another amazing moment of sensing your spirit so powerfully in our midst. We cannot deny that you have been and are here and so we take full confidence and trust in knowing that you're going to go with us wherever we go today. And we want to pray a special prayer of blessing over those who are going to be serving in the community, serving right here in some of our NYC spaces, getting things ready to ship abroad as they're learning about the work that you're doing around the world through your servants in all corners of the globe. And we know, God, that as we get a little bit into NYC, our energy is not quite as full as it once was. And so we ask for an extra measure of energy and focus, of patience and joy, and over all these things, love, as we serve wherever we find ourselves today, whether at an MWO or playing a game in the rec hall, that we would be filled with your love and motivated to serve wherever we are. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen.